Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 229 for Monday, October 7th, 2019. Greetings, folks. Folks, and welcome back to Gig Gab, the show you know it's by, for, and about working musicians. Our sponsor for today is Chauvet DJ at ChauvetDJ.com. We'll talk about them in a little bit here, but I just wanted to let you know. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Los Gatos, California, Paul Kent. Uh, it might be that the next time we say these intros, we're both in different places. Or or we might have to skip a week because of our various travel and relocation and all that stuff, isn't it? So our schedules get a little crazy every once in a while. That's okay. I mean, we're actually, you know, episode two twenty nine, we're at least a ninety five percent hit rate. Like we, we get it done most of the time. I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. We have we have I've always said that that one of the reasons when we started Mac Key Cab years and years ago that I liked the idea of having a co host is the accountability to each other. Like if either one of us needs to reschedule or cancel, obviously we, we can, and we have, but it requires, you know, a straight face phone call to the other guy saying, Hey, I got to, you know, I got to change it. I can't, neither one of us makes the decision at, you know, five minutes before recording time to say, eh, you know, I'm not feeling it today, man. Yeah. <laughs> like that, that, that doesn't happen. Whereas I, I know me, it might, and it, it might not even be, I'm not feeling it. It might be like, dude, I'm slammed with everything. I can, I like, this doesn't make sense for me to just break in the middle of my day and do this. But, um, but you know, we have to be accountable. Really. Yeah. We have to be accountable to our listeners, but, but you and I act as the proxy for each other for that. <laughs> I, guess I agree. Is, is what it's that very is. useful. It's, it's good. It's good awesome. life lesson. Yeah, it is a good life lesson. And it's, you know, and plus I, it, it, it comes with, I say the added benefit, but it, but frankly, it's selfishly, it's the primary benefit is I get to chat with you every week. So that's kind I of know. Cool. I'm thinking about yep. 229 phone calls later. Yeah, it's good. And really, good there role. were probably what two dozen before this less, less scheduled and, and less frequent. But, you know, like Gig Gab had a had a sort of natural evolution into out the, of phone calls, out of phone yeah. calls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like, you know, we have Just things to in. talk about checking in. Yeah, exactly. Did you play this uh, last weekend? I did. Yeah, I had a um. Well, I had what I I posted on Facebook and Instagram and thought would be my final outdoor gig of the season. It was a Monkey Fist gig at a private party that Dunkin' Donuts and the Ronald McDonald House do a fundraiser every year, and they hire us to play. Uh, and they did it this year as last year at there's a big Budweiser like brewery and tasting room and tap room and all of that stuff over in Merrimack, New Hampshire. So they they did it there again. And we set up and it was, you know, sunny, but windy. And it was obviously going to be cold, but we knew that this gig has always been cold because it's been this time of year several times. Not every time, but it's, you know, it's always this time of year. We're like, that's eh, fine. You know, we deal. So I get there and John was running way late. Uh, thankfully, he and I both planned to get there pretty early. So when he was halfway there, he had to turn around because he realized he forgot some gear that we decided was crucial. So that was but it was fine. So I, I'm there kind of chit chatting with some of the people. There was a new person. I skipped the gig last year that I had to meet, you know, and and that was all fine. And talking about where to set up and all of this and like, yeah, go go here. OK, fine. So. I get everything set up. I get the cables laid out. I set up all the stuff that I have and we're chit chatting. And, and even before I set up, I'm like, you want us to inside or outside? They're like, I think, you know, with the fire pits and stuff, people are going to be outside. Okay, great. No problem. So we set up and now it's like, I don't know, it's let's say six 15 or something. We start at seven. Their party started at six. So we had to be set up before their, you know, before the, the guests and all that arrive, which is totally fine. So I go in and I'm getting some food or whatever. And on my way in, we encounter the woman that's sort of running point for the night. And she's like, ah, you know, it's still kind of windy outside. I'm like, all right, well, if you want us to move in, we can, you know, we can do that now. It's fine. I mean, it, it sucks because we're already set up, but it's an acoustic thing. It's basically just mics and monitors. You know, it's not a huge, it's not like there's drum sets and amps and all of those other things to set up. But we had the sound really tweaked outside. Like it was really good. And, uh, and she's like, yeah, no, I think it's okay. And I, I even said to her, I said, well, let's be honest. If we're willing to move right now, 
we're also willing to move after the first set, you know, like, and, and we were just being nice about it because it was true. Like if we're, if we're already set up, it doesn't matter. And uh, she's like, okay, that's fine. And so we get, you know, some food and we sit and we chit chat with each other and about five of seven, it's like, all right, well, it's time to pee and play. So I'm on my way to do the first of those two things. And she catches us. She's like, I think we need to move inside. <laughs> it's like, all right, here we go. <laughs> so, uh, so we grabbed all the stuff and we moved it all inside and we actually got a decent sound going inside. It was a really, it's kind of where, where we were. It was a tall sort of barn thing. Um, and really live in there. I don't want to say bouncy because somehow it wasn't, but it was, it was live. It, it, the room had a natural reverb, but not like a bounce to it, which was good. And, uh, it was a, you know, it was a lower end reverb that it had. Uh, so it was a warmer kind of sound, but it was loud in there because people were chit chatting and they'd been there sure. for, you know, an hour and a half now drinking and, and eating and catching up and all this stuff. So it's like, all right, well, we got to actually turn things up louder than we would have had them outside. All right, that's going to be interesting. So we, you know, we balance the sound. We talked to the, the bar staff, too, and we're like, you guys know, like how things should be in here. So please, you know, we're kind of doing this without taking a lot of time to do it. So. We, you know, any feedback you have, please just let us know. And they did. They they helped us dial it in and actually turned told us to turn it up even a little more. And we got it dialed in pretty quickly. And and the gig went great. It was much better to have been inside and sweat a little bit because we were all wearing flannel and you know mm-hmm. heavier clothes. But um, but it, you know it was better to sweat a little than than freeze. And you know I was I'm always worried about putting a hand through my my pitch slap cajon because. At some point I will, you know, you it's can't a, feel it. It's a piece of wood. Right. Yeah, exactly. And at some point it's going to break. Um, Crazy. But uh, so I always have a spare in my car, but um, but it's not quite the spare that I want. I need like I need to get the same model so that mm-hmm. I, I, I don't know, you know, you know how it is, right? Absolutely. Um, but the gig went cars. the gig went really well. We had, I told you we had done a monkey fist gig last week. Uh, where Jimmy couldn't make it. So we had my friend CJ Lewis sub for us and and as I said last week, it went really, really well, but getting two songs in with Johnny and Jimmy and kind of, you know, our classic 10 year old monkey fist lineup where we just know where each other's going. It was like, Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. There's something really nice about the old comfy pair of slippers to put on here. You know, (laughs) like everything went great, except that there is one. So we play that tune 3am by matchbox 20. Love it. Great song. And John and I, that song, yes, but all night long, every night, we think the same harmony was like, I know where he's going. We, you know, we hit little nuances together. It's great. Uh, You know, and we love it. It's frankly the thing that, that, you know, above all else, I get in the car to go do that because it's amazing, you know. Um, and it's not everybody that I have that with. I, I have it with Aaron and Fling and I have it with John and that's pretty much it, you know, um, and it really is is magic. We both sing the same way and it really works. Uh, and that particular song is often really early in our set. You know, we, we we've started with it many times. Usually it's song number two for us. And it's always butter, like no problem whatsoever. Yeah. Well, not Friday night. Nope. Uh, like I don't I the whole way through the song I'm thinking what am I doing wrong and you know I would like back off and be like okay we've done this you know hundreds of times next chorus is going to be fine like just get it out of your head it's, it's all good you know you've done it before just forget it you're good get to the next chorus nope not this time you know it's like crap and it was that way the whole way through the song and I to this point in time I have no idea what the problem was and we finished the tune and john looks at me and he's like i'm so sorry i'm like what are you talking about and he's like i don't know i just couldn't find my place in that tune like I, I, things weren't right i'm like i don't know that it was you but okay like i'm glad it wasn't just me noticing it you know and, and i asked jimmy i'm like is your guitar out of tune he checked it he's like no it's fine I'm like yeah no i didn't think it was that but I I have no idea what it was. The rest of the night we had like everything locked in some things even better than they usually do, you know, like, but that one song and I don't know, it's fine. Like we're, I'm not worried about it, but it's just one of those as, as it was happening, weird that it happened. Yeah. Yeah. As it was happening, I was sort of laughing about, well, it gives me something to talk to Paul about on Monday, you know, like Uh, (laughs) here we go. You know, I play in that acoustic madness. Yeah. We don't play very much anymore, but 
you know, for me, that has been an amazing ride because both Mariel and Steve, they are pro, they, they are never out of key, right? It, it, they are a constant. They are, they are a metronome. They, yeah. are, they are always on. And, and it, uh, you know, A, I know I have to really focus to play at their level. They, they are two musicians who I have to be, you know. That's great. In the zone. Yeah. But I haven't, we have not had one of those. Now, other things that I've done, certainly I've had those, but I, that it's interesting, you know, this is like three good friends. There's a, that, that, that old slipper feeling, right? It oh, just yeah. falls into place and it's just nice. We don't play very much right now. I mean, I hope it comes around at some point in time. We actually have the first gig in a couple months coming up. In a couple months, we haven't sung together. Um, coming up this month, uh, next week, actually. It'll be fine because you guys have done it. It's the old slippers, right? I mean, yeah, you'll. It is the old slipper. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I hope you don't have a moment like I have, but if you do, just, you know, you'll, I know you'll just <laughs> laugh it off and move on. Yeah. Oh, well, that's it. Yep. Well, I told you, one of my best friends that's a musician, Steve French, um, you know, he's a pedal steel player. He played in that uh, Black Sunday Roadshow project I did a couple of years ago. Just a very, very experienced, great musician. He's like, nobody died. You know, like, you know, you miss a passage, you miss a, you know, you miss a chord. You whatever it is. He's and he's great. I mean, yeah, I don't know that he makes too many mistakes, but mistakes don't phase him. And uh, a bad song doesn't phase him. Nobody, you know, like you're saying you had a bad song, not a bad night. Oh, right? no, it was a, it was just a bad song. And we all kind of yeah. like looked at each other like, I don't know. And the next song was fine. And, and that is the key is you have to even if there's something to analyze afterwards. And in this particular case, there's not because I have no idea what the problem was. <laughs> <laughs> but even if there is, you can't you got to like put it out of your head in the moment because you the next song is what matters that's the beauty of live art right is the next is, note is what matters right you are judged by the last thing you did and yeah. and that's the to me that's what i love about it but you know yeah yeah <laughs> i had a couple of fun gigs this weekend so we the house rockers went back inside for the first time you know since last spring um for our local club and um it was a nice gig. Russ was back after missing a couple of gigs. And it was so great to have him back. And, you know, the band is just old slippers. It is. It's just, it just does, you know, it's really fun. And, you know, when there's a point at which whoever needs to step out, whatever it may be, it might be a bass fill. It might be a breakdown of a song that, you know, wasn't expected. It might just be an emphasis that you really get it when you're, when the rest of the music is, is, you know, I don't mean autopilot in a bad way. I mean that the rest of the music is just happening. Yeah. It makes the things that are different each night, even more fun. You're not, Absolutely. You're not thinking about the stuff that you already know. And th that's what our Saturday night, it was started out. It still was kind of light at about seven 30 when we started. Uh, and we started, you know, there were maybe 20 people in the room, not very many. And then, but it ended up being a good night and a, a fun night. And we got, we got them going and, you know, it, it was just, it's, it's fun to reflect on your band's different capabilities. You know, we were a good outdoor festival concert series band working big crowds in different ways through the summer. And then we get on a little tiny stage where we're literally like a clown car packed on each other. And uh, we just did our thing. And it was just nice to know when your band is, when your band is gelling, you know, when you're hitting, hitting on all cylinders, it's a, it's a great feeling. Absolutely. It really lets you enjoy it in a different way. You do. Yeah. 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 When, when, it can, when you can just get into that flow state where it's just things are happening and you can, like you said, you can notice the enhancements uh, yep. in the moment. You appreciate the solos that everybody's taken. Yep. You're not, you're not preoccupied with your gear. You're not preoccupied with the set list. You're not preoccupied. Right. You know, when, when things don't go well and your head starts getting in there and you're like, Oh, maybe I should change the song order. Maybe, yeah. you know, maybe, you know, this guy's not sounding great on vocals tonight. Let's, 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 uh, you know, yep. give him more. This guy sounded great. Maybe I should throw more to him. Pull the rip or like in our band. This. Yep. Yeah. In our band, you know, because we have rock stuff and soul stuff. Some nights the audiences are better for one type of music than the other. They respond better. And of course you, know, you see them walk off the dance floor for one type of music, walk on the dance floor for another type of music, depending upon where you are or who happens to be there that night, all those types of things. When it's just in flow, it is just such a joy. And then you, you just, you can appreciate the guys you make music or girls that yeah. you make music with so much more. Totally. 
Oh no, it's great. Yeah, maybe 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 comfy slippers is better than old slippers because yeah, yeah comfy. it's not worn out. It's comfy. Yeah, yeah there you go. And my right. Friday night gig. I haven't talked about this too much, but you know, I've had this. I've talked about this coffee house that I play. It's a yeah. it's a medium sized coffee house, and I had done it as a solo for most of last year and a little bit of this year. And you know, I have some guys in our musical community that they're just nice guys. They're friends that I would love to play some music with. And so every once in a while, I'll invite someone to play something with me. And I started uh, thinking that for this coffee house gig, and I had a couple nights where my draw wasn't great. You know, I like, of course. Yeah. You know, you know it happens, right? It happens. Yeah. And I really wanted, I wanted this gig to be a success. I want it to be a success because the woman who runs the coffee shop is awesome and she supports live music so much. And I, I really wanted to fill her place and try and find the right, you know, combination of things. And, you know, sometimes a mellow, because when I do my solo gigs, it's usually kind of quieter music. You know, it's, it's just what I feel I need to do, the opposite of what the house rockers are. But, you know, people, I could see that they, you know, they kind of want to tap their toes and they, you know, want to, some even want to get up and dance. So I put together a little band to play at this coffee roasting. And, and um, not only that, I started thinking about the set list that will do one set of just stuff that would sound good with this arrangement. So, you know, basically acoustic guitar. There are four house rockers in this. So me, Russ is the drummer and he uses, he uses mostly brushes. You know, he brings a really, really small kit. Sure. Like, and it's not even a full size kit. It's like a, you know, miniature stuff. Cock- cocktail kit. Yeah. Something. Yeah. Uh, but no kick. He does use a, he pedals onto something that's, that's uh sure. You know, for, for, for that. Yep. Um, Mendoza plays sax and Simon plays, plays guitar, he plays some acoustic, some electric. Chris, our buddy Chris Green plays keys. And then another friend of mine, Josh Baker, plays bass. And I picked the I picked the songs, things that I know I like to sing and that are, you know, really kind of home run songs for me. Songs that would sound good. So like I found a pretty cool acoustic version of um Little Red Corvette. Mostly an acoustic, right? And it, you know, it's John, got like a, Johnny D sings a version of that in our Monkey Fist gigs, and it's so good. Such a great group. Oh my, Such yeah, yeah. He does this really sort of light, delicate arrangement, which yeah. is a departure for him. He is a belter, you know, and uh, and he, de- but it's and he just plays guitar on it. I'll join him for choruses or whatever to you know to to blend in some harmonies or whatever. But man, it's so good. Yeah, but, but that's what this is. We might be talking about the same version. So yeah. this is a acoustic guitar based version with a little bit of sax interlude on it, a sax solo, you know, kind of picks up during the solo section. Nice. And so one set of that type of stuff. Yep. Acoustic yep. guitar based, you know, soft rock, I guess. And then the second set was going to be songs you know by heart, the Brown Eyed Girls, Margaritavilles, you the know, sing alongs. Yeah. The sing alongs. And and I could see the light bulbs were going on. And remember, light bulbs sometimes go on because it's a great idea. Sometimes they go on because it's the right guys playing the great idea. Sometimes it's the right vibe based upon the lights that are behind you in the busy town. You know, they're yep. keeping people awake yeah, as it opposed to letting them be mellow. Could be anything. There's a lot of things that go into serendipity, right? Anyway, I could tell that the light bulbs were going on and people were really smiling and really getting into it. So we've done, I think, four of them. And I've added one or two more sing-alongs. And, you know, the goal will be to get the, the whole show two, two and a half hours up to that type of stuff. And we played it last Friday night and people lost their minds. It was so fun. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm one of those guys. I'm not one of those, you know, brown eyed girl. The tip is 50 bucks. Free yeah, 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 yeah. Right. I know yeah. if people like the song and I like the song, let's do it. Right. Let's play it. It's totally let's fine. Play it. Yep. Everybody's happy. And so this is all songs, you know, by heart. You know, we play Country Roads, John Denver song. We, play, we played that for the first time on. Uh, we play it in Fling pretty regularly, but we did it for the first time at, um, at as a request the other night. Yeah. And what a great tune. Yeah, it is a great tune. American yeah. Pie. Great yeah. tune. Yeah. And uh, so we did. We have. A, and so now I'm branding it the Great Los Gatos Sing Along. And we had an overflowing crowd, you know, before we even laid down a note on Friday night. It was really like, the. I think the word has gotten out. We've done three, three or four of them. And now it's becoming a thing. And so, you know, I was thinking, like, I have the house rockers and, you know, we do our thing. I have my solo stuff. That's its own thing. Yeah. Acoustic Madness. And then, you know, these branded shows that we do and ticketed shows. And now, you know, we've kind of created, I've kind of created another thing that is a sellable thing. You, I could take this thing along and offer it to other towns or other venues and that type of stuff. I wouldn't do another one in Los Gatos because I want to keep it special for this place. Sure. But 
you know, for local people who just want a night out, they don't want to go to a bar. They want to sit in a coffee house and, you know, have a cup of coffee or a glass of wine and just enjoy some music and smile. This thing fits the bill in so many ways. It's really fun to play. It's really fun to get that interaction from the crowd. Um, all the guys in the band, we, we do um, Obladi and Breen, you know, we changed the key a little bit, but uh, Breen learned the, the whole piano section of it Great. and we just have a blast with it. And you, you kind of also rediscover some of these songs that you have kind of filed away as, well, no, everybody does that. What, but what, they don't what do it, it anymore. It's Steve, Steve Sayakoto's called them aha songs, right? Yeah. Where when you hear it, whether you're the musician playing it or you're the crowd member, you know, enjoying it. It's like, Oh yeah. Remember that tune. Aha. Yeah. You know? And yeah, they're yeah, actually, yeah. there are plenty of them. I mean, for what it's worth, Absolutely. Springfield, there's, you know, we do a hungry heart by Bruce and everybody sings that chorus. And Bruce who? Yeah. You know, Sorry, who. I couldn't help you it. know, who. <laughs> I couldn't help it. Yeah. We, um, I'm trying to think we, we, we play um, dancing in the dark. We do this, it, yeah. this acoustic version that John found. It's a, a little more brooding um, than, uh, you know, than sort of, sort of the, the normal version everybody's used to, but it works really well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For yeah. sure. Yeah. And the point of all this is just kind of finding, as we look to find work, you know, sometimes there are 100,000 cover bands out there. There are 90,000 cover bands playing largely similar. Yeah. Repertoires. Yeah. You know, how do you find your unique niche? And so this packaging up this and packaging up with a title, you know, no, calling it the sing along. I that's the brilliant part here is is that because it, it it's relatively easy to put together a set list of sing alongs, but w doing it with intention and and, you know, I always say I am happy playing any song to a crowd as long as what we're playing is what the crowd expects or if the crowd expects, you know, a surprise and a detour, or if you can make a surprise and a detour work, that's great. But it, if the point is to entertain, then you need to be within the realm of expectations of the people that are showing up to be entertained. I agree. Uh, you know, and, and so we, calling we've it said a, many times yeah. that, you know, the, so many people either restart a cover band yeah. with the idea that I, I've got a unique take on this. You haven't seen my fastball yet. Yeah, right. And maybe that's Whereas true. Like season, yeah. It may be true, but you know, the, the, the seasoned musicians, they kind of know what will keep them working. So well, if, what's if, easy if, to if, keep working. It, like there's not, if you got a good fastball and you can get people to show up expecting, like if you're going to, if you're going to show up, if you're just going to say, come see me play and not tell anybody anything and you don't really have a track record, it, you know, I mean, some, some folks out there have a track record for like, I want to go see what that guy is going to do next. Right? Like that's cool. But unless you're that guy, then you need to tell your people that are showing up what to expect when they show up. And if it's like, Hey, you know, I know you've seen me play with, with Fling and Uptown Celebration and, you know, we're playing tunes that, you know, or some Fling originals that you've gotten to know, like, that's great, but they're all rock straight tunes. Now I'm going to come out and I've assembled, a, I, I haven't because like this would be really difficult to do, but, you know, I've assembled a group of musicians to play Mahavishnu orchestra, orchestra tunes. Right. And, and like, that would be fine. But if I said, Hey, I'm playing a gig on, on Friday night, you should come out and people came out and it was like, in around a flame. What the Risky. hell is this? Risky. Yeah, yeah. You like, you got to tell people what they're going to get. And when you tell people sing along, well, that's pretty good. Cause that's kind of what people want when they don't know what they want. Right. You know, like if you show up and happen to do the sing along thing in any random, you know, coffee house, restaurant, whatever, there's a better than even chance. It's going to go over well. Whereas if you show up and do the Mahavishnu thing in any random restaurant, coffee house, uh, chances are, you know, it's not going to go over as well. So well, I, I've seen many, many, many people who have really strong voices or really strong players. Sure. That get the gig and just be like, all right, I'm going to do what I'm going to do my thing for you. Yeah. But if people don't know what your it. thing no, is, no, I'm, I'm making your point. Yeah, yes. Right. You come in and even though they are quite proficient in what they do, um, 
some people, it's not what they would want and they're not going to go back. And just that kind of right. state of you have to be extraordinary to just say, come see me. I'm going to entertain you. You really have to be very good. Yeah. Well, like when you did your, you know, you've done your tribute nights, you did the Petty one, you've done a Springsteen one, but you didn't surprise people with that last minute. Right. You told people I am doing a Petty tribute night. You might want to come and see this. I would love for you to come and see this. Right. Like people showed up and were not shocked when they heard you play American Girl. <laughs> And, you know, you wreck me and things like that. Like this, it's managing expectations. And that, you know, that's a I mean, we've had this conversation a million times here, but it and and actually we have a question about that that we're going to dig into next episode, because this episode and I do want to get there. We had a great question come in from Tom about uh, a band member of his that got an offer to join. We'll call it. Uh, we'll use Tom's word, a competing band. And, yep. uh, and, and it's a, I, I think there's a good discussion to have here. So I, I would like to do that. The, the first thing I want to do though, Paul, is I want to talk about our sponsor that I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, Chauvet lighting at Chauvet DJ, uh, because that's where you're going to go to get the lighting that you want for your band. Chauvet DJ dot com. That's C H A U V E T D J. Dot com. This is the arm of Chauvet that sells all the stuff uh, that works really well in your band's venues, right? It's not just for DJs. Lighting is for anyone performing on stage because you want to be seen. In fact, when I'm doing these outdoor gigs in the summer, especially in the afternoons, I'm always thinking, OK, I got to bring a lot more of my game because I can't let the lights help Right. But the lights, when you when you are playing an indoor gig or an outdoor gig at night, the lights can be your friend. They can really add to the show. In fact, think about what it would be like if you went to see an arena show and all they did was like put a spotlight on the stage. Like it takes a lot for a performer to be able to make that work for three hours. You got to Like you really got to have some special charisma. But with Chauvet DJ lights, oh, they can help. um add some charisma where it might or might not already be and uh, professionalism and professionalism too. It really, it, and you know, they make it easy. We've been using Chauvet lights, Chauvet DJ specifically lights in fling for years. And it's super easy. Like these things just set up, they're built to be traveled around. They're lightweight because of all the LEDs that they're using. They've got multiple controls, including auto programs and even like sound activation activation modes. They, they've got wireless foot switches so that somebody on stage like Russ and Fling is able to control our light show. If we have somebody that can run our lights, even better. But we can do it ourselves because of how easy Chauvet DJ makes it work. And now we don't have any of this stuff yet, but now... They've added Bluetooth to it so you can control it right from a phone or a tablet. No additional hardware. They've got their BT Air app, which is free. It's really awesome. You've got to check this stuff out and you can rock in the spotlight with Chauvet DJ. Visit ChauvetDJ.com. I'll spell it one more time. It's C-H-A-U-V-E-T and then DJ.com. Check them out. There's a link in the show notes uh, and our thanks to Chauvet DJ for sponsoring. Yeah. All right, right, Dave, I'm going to read Tom's question. Oh, you got it. Okay. I got it right here. Okay, go ahead. It's a little long, so bear with me here, but um, but it's, it's great. So hi, Dave. I have a great discussion for the podcast. So we are a 60s, 70s tribute band that has had quite a bit of success in the last six years. In fact, we just won our local newspaper's Reader's Choice Award for the best local band in our area. About three months ago, our keyboard player and co-leader of the band with me got a call from a competitor of ours, another 60s band that has been around for the past 20 years, to sub for their keyboard player for a couple of gigs. Now, he confided in me, and I didn't bother telling the other band members at the time, but two gigs turned into six or eight gigs, and now they have asked him to jump ship and join their band. The staggering thing is this. The person wants to play in both bands. Our band plays three times a month, most month. And then during summer and spring months, we have our festival season. Our competitor, important word there, our competitor has a lot of bigger festivals and makes more money. They have a sound man and all that stuff. Our band is telling him that he has to choose and he cannot be in two bands at the same time. I was curious to know if you think that we are being fair to him by essentially telling him to go ahead 
and join their band. We feel he has deceived us and should have turned them down. What happened to the days when bands were families and friendly competing competition was just that friendly. He is joining the enemy and leaving the band he founded. Weird, right? Yep. <laughs> So who wants to go first here? I, I mean, I have so many thoughts about this coming from completely two opposite directions, right? As as the band member who has seen people leave and as the or as the band member who has seen people start spreading themselves out, maybe is a, a better way to to approach this. Yeah. And then also, of course, as the I, I, I as the band member who plays in multiple projects and and has has navigated these waters in that way, too. So, so I want to tell you a story to get okay. to get this. Cool. So um, at one of the regular club gigs that we do, um, I n- noticed uh, a band leader from another band would fairly regularly come check us out. And at one of the gigs, after the gigs, he approached one of my guys and was having a conversation. And I knew what the conversation was. Mm-hmm. Right? It was it was I knew what was going on. And um, I. I was, I reacted adversely to it. I didn't, you know, they were having a conversation. I didn't go over and interrupt the conversation, but my guy could tell me, could tell that I was, you know, not happy about it. And months later, when it came up in a conversation about, about ability to do other projects, um, my guy said to me, you know, that one time that that happened, you clearly were not happy about it. And I felt like you were a dog marking me that I was your property. Oh, and that's in interesting. Actuality, in yeah. actuality, what happened was I felt so intensely disrespected that a leader wouldn't talk to a leader first. If I was going to ask someone to sub in my band, that it was in another band that was a working band. Because remember, the premise here, if you ask a guy to take a gig and he takes a gig, I have nine guys who can't work that night, especially if it's one of the guys I can't sub, right? So to me, I just think that there's a leader to leader respect that has to happen. Now, in this case, Tom Thomas's um, situation this is actually one of the co-founders, one of the co-leaders of his band. He's leaving his own band. He's leaving the guys that he ostensibly put together for this, for this project, which is kind of weird. Yep. So I know you have multiple perspectives on this. I think the thing that I react to most about this is, no, I don't think a leader owns the musicians in his band. Sure. I do think that there is a code of honor that should happen amongst leaders even if there is friendly competition or more than friendly competition. But I also do think that it, that, that a band is a social construct and trust is one of those ethos that a band has to have to go play with a band that plays a similar set list as yours. And again, if you're going to play with that band, now my band has a problem. I either have to sub you and be less than what you could possibly be. This all goes back to the agreement that you, uh, you know, that you, tacitly have when you ask people to join a band you explain to them how often you're going to play what you expect and all those types of things sure but i do think that there's um that there is a, a emotional trust commitment that you make to the other people in your band that you know that um you know i won't do anything to harm you you know, I, I won't do anything to make this a not good experience for you. And if you get a sense that a guy in your band has got one eye on the door, you know, wondering when the other band's going to get a call or that he may not be there for you, that makes it, I think that makes it hard for a band to, to gel emotionally that then would translate well to music. That, that would be what I have to say. I, yeah, I actually agree with that last little point there, that it, there needs to be that trust. Um it, it certainly doesn't need to be monogamous for that trust to be there uh, as, as my, you know, uh, first and really sort of the foundational drum teacher once said to me, I was in like high school or something. And, and I was like, I think I mentioned this on the show here before. And I was like, Oh man, you know, I'm playing with this one band and this other band wants me to do a gig with them too. And I don't know, you know, what should I do? And he was like, man, it's not your freaking girlfriend. He's like, you got to play with as many people as you can play with. He's like, if you stay playing with the same people, 
your playing will not grow as fast as you want it to. He's like, it will probably stagnate. He's like, it's great to play with people. There's no problem with that, but th there's nothing to be said that you can't play and shouldn't play with as many people as you possibly can. He's like, that's the only way that you're truly going to grow as a player is by exposing yourself to every scenario you possibly can. I was like, oh yeah, he's totally right. I think that right. path to, to grow as a player is, is, is accurate, but for most of us, you know, 40s, 50s, or, you know, you were really looking just to get a solid, reliable band going. You know, here's, uh, here's a book See, I, I disagree. I think it's way easier to grow as a player when you're 17 than it is when you're 47. And no, that's I, what I'm saying. I'm I, agreeing with you. But but I'm, I'm saying, saying that the 47-year-old actually needs to pursue more opportunities than the 17-year-old in order to keep growing because that momentum is harder to break, right? Depends and, on your goals. So, so sure. here's the upside of that. There's a quote that is, if you have a band that works, you do everything to keep it together because it's such a rare thing. A true he, band. Sure. That, that's fine. That's, but there's, see, I, I think, so, so this is where we're going to disagree here. Um, there's no fundamental truth that playing in multiple projects is bad for any one of those projects, right? It can be true. And the logistics are what sort that out. It, you know, for example, when I wound up joining Chafed, it was a very similar scenario here. Um, now, the, the, the difference is that, that John, uh, who is the, also the singer in Monkey Fist, who was the singer in Chafed and who brought me into that band. And I'll tell the story in a minute. He and Russ from Fling went to, I think, kindergarten and beyond together. But certainly they knew each other, you know, as kids. So so they they communicate that there, there's no like all of everything that that you're about to hear that happened with with Chafed. Actually, you know, everybody was sort of aware as it was happening. Uh, but, you know, Chafed's drummer was having some like family things going on or something. And they called me and they said, look, there's a, these like three gigs that we need you to sub for. I'm like, yeah, no problem. Great. So I do the gigs. And, you know, on like the second gig, they're like, hey, are you also oh, we got another gig? Scott can't do it. Can you do this one? And I was like, uh, I looked at my schedule. Yep, I, I can. No problem. Uh, and then it was it, it just like with what Tom described. It went from three to about eight and somewhere around. I You know, we had like one or two more together scheduled at least. Maybe it was gig six or something. It was a fairly big gig at the dairy field over there in, in Manchester full electric thing. And, um, and John, you know, into the mic says, Hey, and you know, everybody, uh, you know, say hi to our newest member of the band, our drummer, Dave. And I'm sitting back there like, Oh, oh I, I had no idea that I was now in this band. You know, I thought I had agreed to do some gigs. And so obviously we had a conversation after the show about it. And it was like, actually, you know what? Okay. They're like, well, we'd love to have you if you can make it work. But obviously we don't want to step on Flink's toes or anything. I'm like, actually, with the way Flink's schedule is and the way your schedule is, um, you know, we've already proven that it works. Uh, let me talk to the guys in Fling about it. You know, I want to make sure everything's copacetic there because and they're like, absolutely. Yep. Go ahead and do that. And I did. And uh, and obviously things worked out and then chafed, you know, wound up kind of fizzling out as bands often do. And that's part of this is bands often do fizzle out. Uh, and, and it worked out fine. No problem. Um, it wasn't up to John to call Russ and talk to Russ about this. Um, it was up to me. I don't think there's a leader to leader th conversation that happens. Just like if you've got an employee and somebody else hires them, they don't need to come. In fact, it would be, totally inappropriate for them to come to you and say, I want to hire your employee. It's like, no, 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 no. You go to the employee, let the employee be a, a big, you know, adult and navigate that scenario themselves. You might, you know, there might, as a, as a leader of one the two band, are not mutually, mutually exclusive. So I would hope my guy would come and talk to me. And right. That stuff. Oh, they, However, they should. But if, my perception of that other band leader in this competitive environment, that's poaching, Right. And Absolutely, of course pressure, it is. Cool. Let's call let's call it what it is. Well, but it's not. I don't know that I'd call it poaching. I, uh, I mean, well, no. Think about it. Like if I if if somebody comes and talks to me at a gig, right, and says, "Hey, you know, what's your schedule like? I've got a band. I'd love to have you play. Uh, you know, what's your schedule like?" Well, I'm you know I'm pretty committed with with you know what I've got going on here right now. I don't really have enough time for you. 
Like that, I've had that conversation many, many times, and it's up to me. But that person that's asking me has no idea whether or not, you know, three days before I told the current band that they've that they're seeing me in, hey, you know, the, guys, this isn't working. I'm gonna finish out the the next three gigs that you know we have together or whatever, and then I'm out. You well, guys maybe. gotta find somebody you else. Don't know. But yeah, that's but the don't, thing is, you don't know. You so, don't know. You don't know that other leader's intent. He may be like, screw it. I'm going to get mine. And, you know, if I cause hell for this other band, that it could be that it could be innocuous. It could be innocent. Right. The only way you know is to have the conversation. And so to me, but it doesn't happen. Small, leader, it doesn't happen. Leader to leader. It happens. I, to I the, think it should. I go to other leaders. I and I have gone to other leaders and said, hey, is you know, I ha- I'm going to have a need. Is it cool if I ask someone if you guys aren't playing? That's just a form of respect. That's just a form of courtesy. And again, to me. Yeah, but but now you're just treating. Like but see, you, you, you just. You just earlier you said you don't believe that leaders own band members, and now I wouldn't say no if I didn't. If I did, if someone was, I would say thanks for the courtesy. Yeah, you know, go go talk to them. If we're not playing, I hope I hope it can work out for you. I wouldn't be opposed to it. But are, is there but, any scenario where you would tell that person no? I don't think because so. if there is, then you I don't. Are, I don't know if I would tell that person no. I would say thanks for the, but I would probably I might talk to my guy and say, you know, here's the deal. If it's just a couple, cool. But if it's going to be more than that, here's the deal. And as, as I told you when you joined the band, the brand of this band is familiarity. When pe- I want when people come to see the band, whether you're their favorite horn player or you're their favorite you know, rhythm section player, I want them to know they're going to get that every time they come see my band. A very consistent thing. Plus, I want, I believe in the vibe of a band is a valuable and holy thing. I think it's right, but the other leaders, not in your band. Like the, to me, that's between you and your bandmates and should no, no, be. No, no. What I'm saying is I don't know that I would ever say no. I, I, I don't know. I would ever say no to another leader if they came and, and asked me, I, I don't think I would, but the conversation I would have with the band person as a, as a result of that is, you know, Hey, you know, let's keep the channel of communication open, you know, I'm 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 cool with it, but there's a point at which it could become a problem, and I want to make sure that we can talk about it. Sure, becomes a problem. Yeah, but that's so between you I, and your, your bandmate. I would I would say, you know, especially because music communities are small, and yes, you know, and I want to I want to get back to Tom here, but I but I will say, if 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 there's that scenario, you know, band leader, let's say you, know, you got band leader A with with musician a and they're both in the same band band leader b Mm -hmm. shows up and asks musician b hey or musician a do you have time musician a needs to make that decision for him or herself like that 100 percent in part of that decision i would assume but you don't know the dynamics but assuming everything is you know relatively copacetic in band a you know musician a talks to band leader a and says hey i just want to let you know band leader b came up to me and said yep I want to, uh, you know, express some interest. I wanted I told him I wanted to talk to you about it. Now you guys should talk like I I think because communities are so small, that conversation needs to happen. But I would never expect it to happen before the musicians involved, because now it starts to sound like, you know, indentured servitude. (laughs) Like, this is is not horse trading. That's what the guy in my band actually said to me, thought he said, you marked me. And I was Mm -hmm. like, no, that's that's not where I was coming from, because you know, I would be really, careful as band leader, as a band leader. And I say this to you, but I say this to everybody else. If anybody ever treated me like, like that, I would walk. I, I would. I am not interested in being treated like property and nor would you. You wouldn't want to be treated like property either. I Again, don't think I, I, I don't think it's being treated like property. I think that there's a courtesy, a good manners aspect. Absolutely. But because after, here's the deal. You, you know, my guy goes and takes a gig, you know, with another band. And again, like I said, likely that means nine guys in my band can't work. Yes. Or it means, hey, here's a really good paying gig that we would have been able to take, but now we can't take. You know, just or my, my it's that you those. you weren't available that night. Like your band was already not booked, and he happened to have an opening, and he's an adult, and he managed his schedule appropriately, and nothing you would never have known about it if he didn't tell you. Well, I'll here here I'll extract this again. Multiply that one guy by 10 guys. I get it. But you got to have 10 right? responsible guys. I mean, you you have the but, but no if one guy can take the sub gigs and, and g- does that stuff and doesn't and no longer considers it a, you know, a priority or a first call type of thing. 
multiply that by five people who are always looking, you know, saying, all right, well, this is an at will situation and we'll have the same five guys if all five guys are available. But if not, it'll be I just that's an unsustainable model model to me. The argument works fine if it's one guy and you just got a sub one guy. Sure. You know, it's possible but again extract it out you know i have i have nine plus myself i have i have nine good guys who could play with anybody on any night of the week if all of them are like well i'm a free agent and i'll take whatever gig comes what is a band at the end of the day well right? so a band is a, in essence a commitment yeah but you're, i think you're looking at it um i think you need to zoom out because i'll i'll bring fling up right so we've got um this scenario in fling where aaron can't make most rehearsals and even sometimes can't make a gig. And it has nothing to do with him playing in another band. But the reality is the same thing. It means fling can't play and it's his, it's his day job, right? So it, it's another commitment, but it, it could be family. It could be health. It could be like any, it doesn't, I, I think it doesn't matter if it's someone playing a gig with somebody else. In fact, with Aaron, I, because I care about him, I would, be happier for him if it was a another gig because it means at least the guy's playing which i know he loves to do um but it's not you know it's that he's got you know this this job commitment that sort of brings him all over the country and uh scatters his schedule and all that stuff uh but it affects the band exactly the same way as if someone weren't available for any other reason could be a sub gig could be something else and and to be fair, you know, this is a choice that Aaron makes. I, I'm not faulting him for it, by the way. I get it. Um, I, I would probably coach him to make exactly the same choices that he is making. <laughs> In fact, I have. But um, but he, it is a choice. Like he could choose to let his family starve and not have a job and, and you know, play all the gigs that, that Fling wanted to have with him. I, I don't think that's all that smart. And like I said, I care about the guy and would never <laughs> want him to make that choice. Um, but it, it has exactly the same effect on the band and his boss never came to any of us in fling, even when we knew his boss, I mean, it it wouldn't have been appropriate for his boss to come and say, Hey, do you guys mind if I ask Aaron to travel some, like, I know that's going to, you know, kind of screw up your, your gigs and stuff. Um, when, when he was working for somebody that we knew that guy came to us sort of after the fact, like, Hey, I'm, you know, sorry that, you know, this scenario with Aaron is screwing up you know, your, your schedule. And I was like, yeah, it's fine. Like, cool. Like life happens. And you I guys think, bought into this. This was the premise of, of uh, Aaron's participation in the whole band. Not, not initially. This was a change 10, uh, you know, 10 years no, in you all, all rolled with the change. Everyone Correct. could have said, this isn't for me or, you know, but again, I think you guys have adapted a business model that supports that. My business model was never that from the beginning. And as, and I don't, you know, moving forward, it's not that as well. And um, again, familiarity is part of my brand. You know, I want when someone goes out of the way to come see my band, I want them to know, you know. Oh, absolutely. Is my sax player. I want that sax player to be there. Flings the their same way. We, we don't play if it's not the five of us. Got it. Yeah. I but mean, it, then yeah, the we, other thing is, then the other dynamic is the, the way that you solve that, at least for me, with, you know, half the guys in my band are full-time musicians, you keep them working, Right. So, you know, that model has worked for me. I, and in fact, in the early days, I took gigs and went out of pocket to keep the band working because I knew it was building towards something, right? Right. And so I, I get the whole, you know, I don't want to be treated like property. You know, I, the way I would handle it with you is I would have had a real frank conversation. The expectation is that you're available. Like, like we play enough to, to require that amount of commitment. Absolutely. So if we're just one of your projects, it's probably not the right thing for either of us. Right. And, you know, again, I haven't had to institute this, but other bands I know basically say, you can't take, if you want to be first call in this band, you can't take another gig until within 30 days. 30, 30 days or minutes. whatever the number is that works for right. your scheduling dynamic. That's, yep. that's not a bad business rule. No, it's, you know, it's for, not. For and it, handle it completely stuff. handles. I mean, what you... What you're getting at with that, but but just, you know, bigger picture is you need to have managed expectations so that mm-hmm. when band leader B shows up and says something to, you know, band member A, band member A knows exactly 
where the expectations of everybody else in band a are with regards to that schedule. And if it's like, Hey, you know, this gig is in two weeks and he looks and he's like, Oh, that's within the 30 day window. Yeah. I I'm open. Like I'm good to go. And then he marks it. He does whatever he needs to do to mark himself as no longer available on the schedule. Like whatever that dynamic is, that absolutely needs to be there. I mean, but you can tell from Thomas's, you know, long question to us that, a, you know, he views it as a friendly competition, you know, that this situation has created anxiety. So clearly there was an agreement up front. The guy was a leader of the band. So I know if I left my band to go play in a in a another band that was fairly similar or exactly similar, why on earth would my guys say, well, what's special about this? You know, what, what you know, your, your whole heart is into this. You know, your, your, your allegiances are in different places. Here's a good question. When that guy gets a lead, which band does he bring it to? Yeah, no. Well, that was my other thought was, you know, so I, I in in sort of focusing on Thomas, I was my advice to him and to everyone would be you have to take the emotion out of this. Right. You have to look at this logistically. This is the scenario you're in. Right. Sunk costs and all of that stuff. Look at where you are. This guy wants to do both. You need to decide. And it sounds like he Tom has decided, you know. Here is we we can't make it work. We don't want to try to make it work. We don't think it will work logistically with the way these two band schedules work. And I based on what he's described to us, I totally agree with him. Like, there's no question. <laughs> he definitely, I think, is is right that trying to do both in that with that kind of schedule frequency would be a mess. Uh, the net net of this is, you know, the guy who leads or finds the band or the band members who organize, you know, true democracy, you have to you have to discuss this. How much do you want to play? What are you going to do with other, you know, what are the projects they have going on and have some tacit understanding about what that means. And, you know, it's 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 an issue of communications. It's an issue of, you know, everybody's searching their soul for, you know, what their truths are about something like this. I I I get what you're saying about taking emotion out of it. It's a creative endeavor. And I don't know if you can ever really take emotion all the way out of a creative endeavor. I think well, you have to hurt, intentionally you know, take it we out. We build something together. This, this guy, you know, Thomas is saying we got named best band. I mean, clearly they were doing something that worked. The other guy, and again, we don't know both sides of the story. So maybe well, the other guy's like, I've told well, you guys from the beginning. I think I the other guy more. wanted to level up and, and he was on his path there with this band. Right. And, and then he got, an offer from the band that it sounds like he set out to beat. Right. But I don't, it, I, and I don't know enough of the details, but I'm, so I'm going to oversimplify here, but you know, it sounds like he, uh, he set out to beat them without being different just by being better, getting better gigs, getting better bookings, you know, whatever that was. And then it became the opportunity to, sort of level up by just jumping from one company to the other, right? You know, one band to the other It's like, Oh, I'm already at that level. Um, and the grass is always greener. You know, I, there is that. And, and it, but of course it usually isn't actually any greener. <laughs> it just seems that way at the time. So yeah, I mean, I, I would be curious to check in and see where this goes you know a year from now two years from now i think now. your advice to thomas is is it, it, you're you're saying take your emotion out of it but i think what you're really saying is what do you want right right do you want to you know can you live with this or can you not live with it can you really live with it can you you know can, yeah. you, can you truly in your heart and in your mind you know accept that this guy isn't going to be available for stuff it's going to he's his availability is going to be a problem again you know i don't know in that type of situation if that's the situation I would opt into. Right? Well, it depends on how easy it is to replace that person too. Right. I, I mean, guess. that's well, a, maybe, or it's like, no, this band is best when it's like this, this band is, you know, if I had to make a change in any one guy in my band, it would, and I have, right. Yeah. yeah. It, it takes a while for it to be as good as it was. Absolutely. And, and you don't know if you're going to get there. And no, it's um, always a question. And you built right. something, you right. You, you know, you put your heart and soul, everybody in the band has dedicated and put their heart and soul into something. They have built something together. I think bands are a team sport. Yes. There can be a leader. Yes. There can be a general manager or a coach or, you know, whatever, whatever you want to call the leader is. But I do think, you know, competition is certainly the most obvious of it. You, you, many of us, you and I are wired this way. 
we want to be the best we can be. We want to be the best band. We want people's hearts, minds, and dollars, right? We want we want people to go out of their way to come see us. We want people to pay money to come see us. We want people to pay money to hire us. I mean, you do that by, you know, competitively, you know, always advancing the ball, always, always upping your skills. And you go through that with people. And that is a hard thing to say, take emotion out of it. If everybody is working towards this creative result together, um, it, it, it will hurt and sting if someone leaves, it will hurt and sting worse if someone leaves for you know the very same people who you've been working, you know, to, to position yourself better. And again, it is friendly competition in general. I have not had too many experiences where something facetious has happened. Joe, my old drummer, yeah, he he played in this area in the 70s, and there were it and it was a hop in music scene then. Uh, and they were playing, you know. Every weekend, you know, he was making a living as a cover band musician. And he said, you know, they would do these showcases. And yes, there was bands, you know, screwing with the sound system when another band would go on. And there was all sorts of like nasty. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I don't, that, I, I don't, I don't, I don't see that as much now. as I did back in like right. the late 80s. I don't know there why, but I, I maybe it's because I'm not 17 anymore and I'm rarely playing with other bands that are, you know. Exactly. But, um, but yeah, I see but less it is, and less it is a competitive team sport. It, I mean, there are X know, amount of gigs. I, so here's the thing. You and I are wired the same competitively. However, I I have as much as I would want to uh, be someone's rival. I, I am like I always in the end find myself as their partner. Like I am not somebody that ever wants to burn a bridge. And the reason, the reality and the way you, I sort of come to terms with this every single time that it happens, it doesn't matter if it's music or business or anything else is that really, I know the only person stopping me from moving forward is me. Right. And, but it's really difficult to wake up every morning and look at yourself as the enemy. Right. So it is good to put a proxy in place for that, you know, and sometimes it's like, OK, that over there, that's what I want to beat. Right. And then you work towards it. But you need to be careful, of course, because when you beat when you hit a goal, you got to be careful. Your momentum doesn't stop. So as you get close to the goal, it's like, oh, now I'm going to be their partner and I'm going to find the next thing. You know, I never actually want to hit my goals. I just want to keep the momentum going, make the system work so that I'm moving forward. And all the way along the path, I wind up becoming partners and friends. And it's worked out really well for me in business. I mean, it would I be further along if I truly was able to treat, you know, other people as like my actual enemy? Perhaps. Right. I well, you're just, going too far. The concept is not enemy. Your, comp, your competitors don't have to be your enemy. No, that, but, just, but you have to look at them as like competitors. And I don't and I don't like I, I if I actually sit down and think about all the other bands out there, it's like, am I do I get that twinge of competitiveness when I find that they got a gig I would have wanted mm -hmm. to get? Yes, absolutely. But am mm -hmm. I really competing with them? No. What I'm feeling is crap. I should have made that phone call. I could have done this like that's really what's going on. And I always find myself looking inward in those scenarios. And it's like, yeah, they made the phone call. They got the gig. Like, OK, well, I'll, next time I'll I got to do that. On this and I'll just say, you know, I recognize it's a competitive game. It doesn't mean that that I ascribe evil to my competitors. Sure. No, I, no, and never. I, you right. know, they if they, I was having this conversation the other day with a friend and there's a, a band that came down to my area they, they, from San Francisco. They came down. They are awesome. They play great. They look great. Their show is great. And, uh, you know, someone said, hey, you know, you guys got the weekend up. He goes, oh, no, no, we got two tomorrow. Then we're flying to Phoenix to do a corporate there. And they're, they're making a lot of money. Sure. As, as, right. They're there. They're that band. Um, and uh, and I envied that. And I'm like, you know, note to self. That's, you know, we got to keep I got to keep working. I, get, I don't ascribe it. evil or hate. And I have a good network of, you know, of musical friends. And I try to. I try to be a good, friendly competitor. I refer gigs to other people. I, you know, I network quite a bit. I ask questions, but I recognize at the end of the day, that festival has one headline slot. I want it yep. for my band. So how do I go get it for my band? And, and, well, and maybe, if I don't get it this year, how do I get it next year? Maybe this guy with, with Tom, uh, you know, is the same way, right? Like he, I think he co-founded the band. I think he, you know, certainly was co-leading the band, but it, you know, and so, you know, it makes sense that he would mm -hmm. want to continually level up. 
maybe over six years and I have I've never if I've seen videos or whatever of Tom's band, I, I they do not come to mind. So I, like this is just a speculation. But maybe that guy, knowing what he knows, knew that he couldn't do that with that band. And that band was never going to be the thing that leveled up. Maybe have, have the conversation though. Right. Otherwise you're left with, you know, Tom being like, what the hell's going on here? Should I, shouldn't I Right. those conversations? Well, but maybe that's the conversation that's actually happening. Maybe the guy didn't realize it True. until he had True. subbed for this other, other band three times. And was like, okay, wait a minute. Like, look where they, I thought we were so far along. And then I got to see behind the curtain over here. Like, whoa, it would take so much work for me to convince these other five guys to do the things I think we need to do to get to this level. Or I could just be at this level right now. Like I'm already there. Do I want to go and try and reinvent the wheel? Or is this really the wheel I always wanted to be a part of in the first place? Right? Like it sounds like there's some level of that with what's going on here. And it's okay. I mean, but this is the thing: the lack of good communication ends up being butt hurt feelings. It is always, it's, always, it, always, always. You know, it is, and 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 clearly. But but not everyone. I mean, you know, it's easy for me to sit here and and sort of look at this without all the information and and you know without actually getting any any feedback while I'm saying it, so I can look like a genius, but I'm really not. Um, but, but, you know, and say, OK, well, maybe this is the easy, easy answer. Things are never actually that easy when you're in the thick of them, even if you could distill it down and say, oh, that's the easy answer. Right. Um, you know, and I like, again, you know, I think about my experience, whatever it was, five or six years ago when uh, when I was I, it was Russ and Fling. So this, again, very different sort of scenario. But. When I got the opportunity to get back into doing theater gigs, did that hurt Fling's schedule? Absolutely. It, mm -hmm. You know, um, was it competitive with Fling? Well, not really, other than for Dave's time. Right. But, you know, it, when it started, it was a thing that Russ was producing. Russ's wife and he produced that next to normal show, which was the first one that I got back into. And uh, and it worked out to be a really good thing. And it helped me advance my playing and sort of, you, you know, find this thing that find a way to be excited about learning more and really honing my craft. I I'll tell you, there are few things in my life that drive me to be a better musician and really practice and really woodshed things than when I have to play in a new scenario with that, that comfortable scenario. I mean, you know, here we are comfy slippers, right? Thomas and, and his bandmates are now in, you know, uncomfortable slipper territory for a little while, as, <laughs> as is the guy that's leaving. Right. Like, I mean, he's got to do the same thing. And maybe that challenge was the, the thing he felt like he was missing. It's really hard. And maybe as a band leader, you, you know, you and, and me, I mean, we can all kind of take this uh, as as a thought to to ponder in our uh, in our meditative well, I'll, time. I'll is, leave you. With well, this, I mean, with like, this. think about think about that, though. How do you keep your band appropriately challenged, especially if you've got guys in the band that are of different skill levels? I get it. The, the, let me give you my summary. Yeah. It's about I had one guy join the band and when he joined the band, he had another project that was original music that he let me know. It's original music. You know, it's it's more like a hang with some guys I like to do it with. It's maybe half a dozen shows a year, maybe once every other month. And I was like, okay, I can accept those terms. That's okay. Um, all of a sudden, after a couple of years, they were trying to make a run at you know doing something more. And it sure. turned into a lot more than half a dozen a month. And I raised the issue. And I said, you said it was half a dozen a month. And the guy got very upset with me. And he said, you know, why would you want to keep me from doing something I love? I thought we were friends. You know, me expressing my original music is really important to me. And I said, I get it. But we had an agreement. And, um, you know, if you're working, it means a bunch of other guys, you know, can't. And that's rips at the fiber of what I'm trying to build here. And we kind of went around about it for a while. And mostly what it rang to me. And up until this point, so this is maybe maybe eight or nine years into the House Rockers history, um, I, it would not dawn on me to play with other people. Everything in my life was about house rockers, build the house rockers, build the right. house rockers, build the house rockers. Every waking moment, every breathing moment was about, was that, and this was like a really, you know, 
and I get it. I was naive at the time. Musicians want to play. I do get that. And, and this incident is one of the things. So that's when I, so it must've been a little bit longer than that. Cause that's when I started to be like, all right, well, I, you know, maybe I'll go do some solo things or do some things. And all of a sudden those solo things and acoustic madness turned into as many gigs per year as house rocker stuff. Yep. And, and now um, that takes away from what the house rockers can do. It does. And actually I have to look myself in the mirror and be like, well, I'm, I'm not eating my own dog food here. I'm <laughs> like, you know, I'm booking stuff and I'm saying, well, I'm going to do this because I deserve to. And then I think yeah, it doesn't, it band. doesn't look like a conflict in the moment. And, I, right. and, and, and like you said, you're looking yourself in the eye. I know you know this, but for anybody out there, you, you know, this problem that Tom is describing to us would not be a problem if the the person that wants to be in both bands is booking both bands, right? Like now, I mean, it, it would be a problem, but there would never be a schedule conflict, right? Because mm -hmm. that, that person yeah. is magically open right. on the nights that he or she needs to be over. Right? Like, so, yeah. yeah. And yeah. so for, for me, you know, I actually had to take a good hard look at it, thinking about the amount of nights I'm taking out of inventory. And so, my favorite thing is to play in the house rockers. I, I, and actually I having done the last five years of doing over a hundred acoustic gigs a year. Yeah. And it's fun. And there's other things that are good. What I got back into playing music for was that feeling of playing in a band and, you know, going through something and accomplishing things with a team. That is the thing that's most important to me. And so it's taken me a while and certainly, you know, I can't ever get those nights back that I didn't book the band. Um, but now, you know, I have this one thing that I really like to do. I have some off nights that, that the likeliness of the house rockers getting booked is really, really low, but my head has come 360 degrees around. Like the very most fulfilling, fulfilling thing I do is playing in this awesome band with these really good guys and achieve things together as a team, you know, and that said, it would really hurt now that I've come back around to this place where I, where yeah. I should have been the whole time. If someone else was like, yeah, that's good, but I got this other thing going on. <laughs> you know, that, and yeah. I get it. And, that, that's, and, and that's hard, but that's what I'm saying. Keeping yeah. a band together is a fragile oh, yeah. inter interconnection of personalities and commitments and communication. And you have to work at all of them all the time. I take guys from my band out to dinner all the time. If I think a guy's, you know, uh, not, if I get that sense that he's a little disconnected, I go out of my way to try and get him reconnected. I ask a lot of questions. I say thank you a lot. I I try to do as many things as I can to make that fragile fabric. Well, as keep the as you're keeping the communication open. I mean, you're doing it in in very productive and uh, and excellent ways. But like the net is, you're making sure that if someone is experiencing some problem, it doesn't come as a surprise to you. And, right. and that, that's a, that's a great thing. Cause sometimes you can head that off. Sometimes you can't, but sometimes you can't. All right. So I have two things to say. What one is, cause I'm kind of a jackass. Um, so, so I'll ask you this question, but first I want to, my advice to Tom is take your emotions out of it. And, and, and in, in terms of how you're making the decision, just like make the decision and, and don't and more, maybe when I say take your emotions out of it, it's more it, of course, they're going to factor into how you make the decision. Take your emotions out of how do you communicate that decision to anyone outside of your very close circle, because it is a small world. Right. Mm -hmm. And all of the people involved, the people in the other band, the people in your band and the people, the guy that is bridging the gap between the two and leaving one and going to the other or whatever is going to wind up happening. Like you will, if you don't encounter those same people again, and you probably will, you will definitely encounter people that they have talked to and they will encounter people you have talked with your and, reputation. Is yep. Of the most important. It is. And, and so, you know, just really, really try and keep emotions in check when you're communicating that stuff. Um, and, and have, even if it's not your actual explanation, have an unemotional explanation for why you've chosen to do the thing that you chose to do. And that actually is helpful internally too. Cause it's like, Oh, yep. I am making a logical decision in addition to making potentially, you know, something that's, that's emotional. So that's my advice to Tom and everybody else. My question to you is let's say you get Stephen Mary Ellen in uh, acoustic madness how would you feel if that never happened 
And five years later, you found out that Steve went up to Nick, your keyboard player in the House Rockers at one gig and said, hey, I'm thinking of asking Paul uh, if he wants to do an acoustic thing with me. What do you think about that? And Nick said, oh, dude, no, we're too busy with the House Rockers. You shouldn't talk to him. I know I'm being a jackass. You but are I'm, being a jackass. Again, I, I never said you shouldn't talk to him, right? I, I, I no, I know. I, I know. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just um, saying that's how that conversation could go. And that's the... It, that's the the concern is what it like if it's just a heads up, then that's not a conversation. It's just a hey, I, I wanted to let you know I have or am going to talk to you, one of your band members as opposed to. But if it's a conversation before they've talked to that person, now there's the ability to influence what that person was going to do. And that's where I feel like there's a really slippery slope. Well, Again, things are not always that black and white. Right? No. So here's the thing. I am this way. Okay. I am this way. Mm -hmm. um, I will not refer business to this other band leader. Right. I get okay? that. So, yeah. so here you go. You know, if you want to deal with me and my, you can go ahead and do it. Sure. But in my mind, you know, you're messing with my business and I'm not cool with it. And, uh, and oh, that's again, totally. I'm not, I'm not asking for permission. I'm asking, I'm, I'm asking you to have extend me the professional courtesy of having a conversation before you potentially create a problem for my, for my band. Yeah. 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 I think it, I think I I'm totally with you on the professional courtesy thing. I think the appropriate time for it is after the first conversation with your band member has happened. Hmm. Just, just because like that needs to be whatever it is. And, and I um, think I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't ding someone if they did it that way. I would right. prefer it the other way, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm yeah. not going to be so prescriptive as to say, you know, before you kiss the ring, it has to be like, <laughs> yeah, right. I just think, you know, courtesy, courtesy is courtesy. And if you have Absolutely. well-intentioned courtesy, yes. Right. But you know, now when I have, I've had, when I are both wired competitively, my first reaction, not to assume everything is benevolent, right? My right. first reaction would be like, you know, and, and, and again, I'm only, I'm only acting the way I, like I said, I, if it's another band situation, I go to the leader and say, Hey, you know, is it cool if you guys are not working? If I, if I, you know, ask yep. your guy if you can sub for me, I try and eat my own dog food in that case. No, I get the that scenario I gave yeah. was like, you know, I went out and booked a whole bunch of stuff it was an overreaction to the cold water being thrown on my face that my band members might do this. I was like, so I'll, no, I don't want to, I'm, I'm going to do it first. Like, yeah, exactly. I'm, exactly. Yeah. And like I said, having well, it's, gone a, it's, down a, that it's path, a natural defense mechanism. I get it. There yeah. you go. Yeah. I, and, and as I, as I explored my own creative path, I did get quite a bit out of it. I have had some fun playing with some other people, but it should be the same rule. In fact, when Russ joined the band, he said, I noticed you have a lot of acoustic gigs. And I said, well, you know, there's a certain degree of executive privilege that I get, you know, since I'm doing all the work. And I don't know if he exactly he he intellectually accepted that answer, but I would imagine, you know, it probably didn't work. Anyone, it shouldn't work well for him. And I should be subject to the same thing. I can only take gigs within a 30 day period. You know, I'm going to try and you know organize this or at least over communicate it to the band. Here's my schedule. If you guys want to take, you know, whatever you do, you know, whatever you want to do. Um, and a lot of the acoustic stuff will be like a Sunday afternoon when the, when the house rockers don't yeah. work anyway. No, so that, it, there yeah. are ways to do it. Communication is the essence of it. Good intention is the foundation. Well, that's the, the key. That That's right. Yeah. And, and even, but good intention can still lead you to a path of, you know, frustration. Uh, but at least it's not, malicious frustration <laughs> I agree. you know at least it's yeah. not intentional frustration you know it's like oh okay i thought i could make this work and i and i'm 100 percent with you in fact you know when we talked to kenny aronoff uh here on the show we asked him about this specifically because he's a busy dude and he says yes to a lot of gigs but when you know fogarty calls he's gotta go like he is that guy and you know his answer is I'll figure it out, even though he knows like it's impossible to be in two continents at the same time. Like <laughs> that is not going to happen. And yep. but, you know, it it like it's the same thing for that dude as it is for us. It's just but any gig he more. takes. He lets them know if Fogarty calls, I got to go. Correct. Right? Correct. Yeah. When Max yeah. Weinberg was was drumming for Conan O'Brien. When Bruce calls, I got to go. I got to go. Yeah, exactly. Right. So it just it's good communication. Yeah. It's tacit. It's being clear. You take care of a lot of butthurt if you communicate well. Yes, for sure. 
All right. Well, this was good. I actually learned I knew, a lot. I knew we were not going to be on the same page about this. No. Oh, no. I think earlier today when when we were putting the agenda together, uh, let me, I said, uh, oh, great topic. I predict a fight. Uh, so <laughs> there you go. <laughs> no one was harmed, though. No one was harmed. It's all good. Uh, all right. Well, that's perhaps the longest episode we've ever done. Certainly the longest that we've ever done with just the two of us and maybe the longest ever. So thank you for listening, everybody. Thank you to Chauvet DJ for uh, for sponsoring this. Check them out at ChauvetDJ.com. Thank you, my friend, for a spirited and respectful uh, discussion. Like I said, I learned a ton. This, uh, I have a new uh, a new framing of my perspective, which is always what it is. What about you, man? You got anything to say? Uh, what is it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Always be performing. <laughs>